thank you for your interest in our study of a man called Peter. This is now the third class, and uh, we are looking at his life and his teachings. We have thus far looked at his calling and the beginning of his ministry. We're going to continue that today. Peter was a disciple of Christ. There were 12 selected by Christ. And a disciple meaning a student or a learner. Christ, Christ gave all of them, and certainly including Peter, on-the-job training for three years. I want us to look at that rather carefully today because it almost seems as though, and of course it, it was true in the mind of God that this is all planned, and that it was planned for Peter and the others to go through this experience working with Christ while he's on the earth, and then they would take over when the church is established and be the leaders. So uh, it seems like there's a curriculum here. And it starts gradually, and it increases in, in the responsibility that's handed to Peter. Now, he does seem to have a position of prominence. Uh, Jesus seems to prefer him in some instances. Hence, the early church considered that uh, there was a primacy attached to Peter. As the Roman church developed, he was given the position of, of pope and head of the church. But looking at simply what the Bible says, there's no doubt he is a great leader in the church, particularly in the early phase of it. So let's look at his curriculum. First of all, he was allowed to observe Christ. And what he observed was Jesus performing miracles. And, and in this we see it is simply Christ working, and Peter is learning by observation, kind of an apprentice. For instance, Jesus went to Peter's house in Capernaum, and his mother-in-law was living in that house. She had a bad fever, and Jesus healed her. Peter was witness. Secondly, when he had fished all night and caught nothing, Jesus told him to put out again and try, and he did, and he caught a huge catch of fish, a supernatural catch of fish. And thirdly, third time to witness Jesus performing a miracle, the ruler of the synagogue had a daughter. She was quite ill. She died. And people gathered for a funeral service. <clears throat> and as was a custom among the Jews, there were professional mourners there. And they were mourning. And uh, they were praying. They were crying. And Jesus just told them to be quiet. He said, she's not dead. She's asleep. They laughed at him, and he put them out of the house, and only with <clears throat> the parents present, <clears throat> he raised her from the dead. At this point, Peter had witnessed three miracles of Christ, and there's no doubt about their authenticity. Now, in the next set of, uh, of lessons that Jesus gave to Peter, he gradually begins to involve him in the process. For instance, Jesus was walking on the water, <clears throat> clearly a miracle. He walked on the water in the presence of Peter. He knew that would attract Peter's attention. It did. And Peter said, if it's truly you, Lord, let me walk on the water. So Jesus enabled him to walk on the water. All went well as long as he kept his eyes on Christ. When he looked away because of the size of the waves that were growing larger and larger, due to the wind, he began to sink. Point being, keep your eyes on Christ. <clears throat> Secondly, he was placed in a situation where Jesus posed the question to the twelve, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And Peter answered quite correctly, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. He passed that test with flying colors. He didn't quite get that right. We'll look at that in a detail in just a moment. So uh, then there were several misconceptions. He had the right intention, but he didn't have the right information. So we'll look at that also. Now, the point at which he graduated from this discipleship school, <clears throat> of course, would be at Pentecost. At that point, Jesus has left. He has ascended into heaven. And the disciples at that point become apostles, meaning one set out. And they are sent out in the Great Commission to preach the gospel uh, to all creation, Peter being the spokesman and leader at that point. Now, let's look at some of Peter's misconceptions in detail. 
First, his misconception about the death of Christ. The account in Matthew, and remember that in Matthew, uh, there are a number of incidents involving Peter, particularly in his uh, matter of gaining more and more responsibility, that are grouped around Matthew 16, 17, 18, 19. In Matthew 16, 21, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're a hindrance to me. You're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the thing of man. This is recorded also in Mark, and I want us to notice it. And he began to teach them, saying that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he, Jesus, rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Now, why did the Lord call Peter the devil? Interesting to call him the devil, to call him Satan. But he really was uh, taking the side of Satan. Satan would have done anything within his de devilish power to prevent Jesus from going to the cross. He tried on multiple occasions to stop that, because if Jesus didn't go to the cross, he could not die. He could not therefore offer an atonement, a, a perfect sacrifice to the Father for our sin, to cover all of our sin. We would have no salvation. And Peter is actually saying, you didn't go to the cross. I'm not going to let you go to the cross. Far be it from you. So he, in fact, was rejecting the eternal purpose of God. Now, another misconception. Peter came up to the Lord and said, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me? And I forgive him. As many as seven times. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times but 77 times. Some versions read 70 times seven. The point being, if you forgave that many times, you've lost count a long time ago and, and you go on forgiving. Now, why did Peter say seven times? He thought he was being very gracious to forgive a person seven times. Under the Jewish system, two is considered sufficient, such as two witnesses for something. Three is considered absolutely sufficient. He goes beyond three to seven, which is the number of completeness. And he thought, surely this is going to be uh, the most that you could do for somebody seven times. That's enough, <laughs> certainly enough. But Jesus multiplied that number. The point being to Peter that one should not limit the number of times forgiveness is offered. Thirdly, another misconception was about rewards. Jesus said to his disciples, truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Then Peter said in reply, see, we've left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Jesus said to them, truly, I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters, or father, or mother, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. Now let's see what's happening here and how this becomes a real misconception. Jesus said it's easier for a rich man to enter the kingdom 
it, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom. Now, what, of course, Jesus has in mind is that the rich man is going to put his trust and his confidence in his riches and not in Christ. I think Peter is thinking, understand that, but surely people have to offer something to God that is truly a sacrifice for uh, there to be a, a reward given. That's the way rewards work. You do something and you're rewarded proportionally. And the rich man doesn't have to sacrifice anything. Of course, he has all this money, and he's not going to miss it if he gives a huge amount of money. And on the other hand, Peter begins to think, but we have sacrificed everything. We didn't have all that money to begin with. We've given up everything. Surely we're going to be saved. That is a sacrifice that is made to God that will be rewarded. Well, Peter is betraying what so many people have, a work righteousness mindset. The idea is that uh, the wages are there. Uh, they're paid for, for, for what you've done. Uh, and God has made a transaction with you. And that idea that you're going to put God in your debt by doing so much good is simply wrong. Because it is by grace we're saved, through faith. So that work righteousness mindset doesn't get any rewards. So Jesus' response to Peter is, hold on. Wait a minute. You're going to be rewarded. I'll take care of that. We'll, we'll see that you're rewarded. You're going to be rewarded far more than you ever could be rewarded in this life. It's going to be amazing sitting on 12 tribes, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And now the point is, just follow me. Now, the transfiguration. Another thing, we looked at that a moment ago, looked at the idea of it. The transfiguration is a major event and Peter did fairly well with this. He didn't totally pass the test. So maybe you can think, what grade would you give Peter for all this? Again, this is going to come from that section of Matthew. This is Matthew 17. And a similar account is found in Mark chapter 9. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah. Now let me stop. Moses would represent the law. Elijah would represent the prophets, the first great prophet. So the law and the prophets. And Moses and Elijah appeared with Christ, talking with him. And Peter said uh, to Jesus, Lord, it's good that we are here. If you wish, I'll make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Tents like tabernacles. Think about uh, the Feast of Tabernacles to, to honor, uh, in this case, these three great individuals, law, prophets, and Jesus. So, uh, he thinks he's, he's going to do something really great for Jesus. He's recognizing Jesus is on a, a level with Moses and Elijah, law and prophets. Uh, to Peter's way of thinking, that is really going a long way for Christ. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And a voice from the cloud said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise, and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. No Moses, no Elijah, only Jesus. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. And the disciples asked him, then why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? He answered, Elijah does come, and he will restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they pleased. So also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them of John the Baptist. 
let's notice the account in Luke because there's a different wording here and I think it's important we notice it. Luke 9, 29. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face, Christ's face, was altered and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now, Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep. And when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the two men, the men were parting from him, Jesus said to Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's good that we're here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And not knowing what he said. And as he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them. And they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. Of course, the reason for keeping silent is the fact that Christ had not yet died. Therefore, the gospel was not yet complete. And to, to speak these things prematurely uh, would only be, bring about confusion and perhaps needless resistance to Christ. The difference between the account that I read in Matthew, it is similar in Mark, and this account with Luke it is in one word, the word glory. And we understand that the transfiguration is not only the fact that Jesus appears with Moses and Elijah and then with Jesus alone, but the fact that Jesus appears in his glory. This is one of the few times that Christ appears in glory in this earth. And Peter was a witness to this along with James and John, the glory of Christ. So the transfiguration of Jesus is a good example of the fact that Peter, along with the two sons of Zebedee, James and John, belong to Jesus' inner circle of disciples, given special privileges and special and particular responsibilities. So they seem to be associated together in Galilee, and Jesus placed great confidence in these three and gave them exceptional responsibilities. Yet, they often displayed human traits of weakness and mistakes, particularly Peter. So let's move now down past the three years, the end of that three-year period, to the time of Jesus' death. During that time, Peter has grown, Peter has learned, Peter has seen, he's witnessed, he's gradually been given more and more responsibilities. But uh, all of that tended to make him feel a bit overconfident, trusting on himself more than he should. And we find Peter on occasion boasting about what he's going to do or not do, and not being able to live up to those boasts. For instance, uh, at the time of the instituting of the Lord's Supper, afterwards, we pick up the reading from Mark 14, when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, you will all fall away, for it's written, I will strike the shepherd. And by the way, that's God striking the shepherd, quoting from Zechariah. I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I'm raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, even though they all fall away, I will not. And Jesus said to him, truly, I tell you, this very night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. That's a boast that he was not able to keep. In the account in Luke 22, Peter said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny me three times that you know me. In John 13, the account reads, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, Will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. And thus the accounts of this event in the life of Christ and of Peter are consistent. The prophecy is he's going to deny him three times before the rooster crows twice. 
So we move into the garden, Matthew 26. He came to his disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. It's a good definition for Peter, the spirit willing, but the flesh weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, my father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, sleep and take your rest later on. See, the, son of, the hour is at hand. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let's be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And when Jesus is arrested, having been betrayed by Judas Iscariot, Peter takes his sword out and cuts off the ear of a servant. The account in Matthew is not specific. When they came up and laid hands on Jesus, that is the guard, and seized him, Behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. But John is very specific. Then Simon Peter, and you know when the two words names are used together, Simon and Peter, particularly in John, the idea is to impress upon us the significance and the importance of that event. So Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it, and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Obviously, this was the chief uh, servant for the high priest. Now, recall Jesus predicting, prophesying, stating plainly that Peter would deny him three times. We see how that prediction came true. The account in Matthew reads, Peter was sitting outside, this is subsequent to Jesus' arrest. He's been taken into the temple. So he was sitting outside in the courtyard. And a servant girl came up and said to him, You also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you mean. And when he went out to the entrance, he went into the, the temple courtyard, then he evidently went back out to the entrance. When he went out to the entrance, another servant girl saw him and said to the bystanders, well, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up, said to Peter, certainly you too are one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear. I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the saying of Jesus. Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. And we can understand why he would have wept bitterly. All his boasting came to naught. The spirit was willing, but the flesh was weak. And you see a similar account of this in both Mark and Luke. In the account in John, if we can go to that for a moment, uh, John stood outside of the door. The other disciple, <clears throat> or Peter, I'm sorry, Peter store, stood outside of the door. The other disciple was John, who was known to the high priest. Very interesting that John knew the high priest, or at least the high priest knew of him. So no doubt that gained entrance for both Peter and John. So uh, John went out, spoke to the servant girl, and she was keeping watch at the door and brought Peter in. So because of his knowing the high priest, he's able to bring Peter in also. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, you also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? And he said, I am not. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold. They were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them standing and warming himself. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, you also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I'm not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it 
and at once the rooster, rooster crowed. So you have John's account somewhat different, but as you would expect, because John was there along with Peter, uh, John was very closely associated with Peter and with the Lord, you expect John to be able to give a much more detailed account, which he does. So let's move now to the time of the resurrection and the fact that Peter, though he went to see the place where Jesus was buried, failed to get the meaning of the cloths that were around Jesus' body. This is from John 20. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, John, and said to them, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they've laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping down to look in, he saw the linen claws lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet, they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their home. Now, again, we see John giving us a much more detailed account and he does so, as he's guided by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he does so so that we can see clearly the picture of what happened. When Mary Magdalene came to report that uh, the tomb was empty, she'd seen the empty tomb, uh, ran and told Peter and John, and they said they've taken the Lord out of the tomb. So Peter and John started running toward the tomb, running together. But the other disciples... John got there first. People say this, consider that John is much younger than Peter, no doubt. So a younger man who can run faster. And he got there, look in, but he didn't go in. Know that Simon Peter always is quite uh, forward. Uh, he's willing to go in where others are not. So he didn't stop. He just went right on the moon. He went in. He saw the linen cloths. He looked at them. And, and considered them. There are different verbs for see, and the verb used here with Peter looking at the linen claws indicates that he looked pretty carefully at them. And, and uh, he saw the linen claws. They were claws that were wound around the body of Christ, typical to a, a burial. And the face cloth was placed over the, the head, the face, separate from the other cloth. So he saw all of that. And uh, he observed it, but he didn't quite understand fully the significance until John got there. Or he and went in. He was out there first, but he, he stayed outside. But he comes down into the tomb at this point. He saw all that Peter saw and believed. For as yet they didn't understand the scriptures. He must rise from the dead. But John understood. And the verb for see there is the idea of, of looking at something with the intention of finding out what it means. And John did that. In the account in Luke, Jesus appeared to Peter before appearing to the other apostles. That's interesting. Again, they see somewhat preferential treatment for Peter. Luke says, they found the 11 and those who were with them gathered together saying, the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Paul gives this account as he is reporting about the resurrection to the church in Corinth. For I delivered to you as of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, then to the twelve, again, Peter first in the 12. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, last of all, 
as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. So if we move now to the incidents uh, just uh, preceding Jesus' ascension after his resurrection, uh, they've seen Christ. So what's the reaction? Simon Peter said to the others, I'm going fishing. He's going back to his old life. He really doesn't understand at this point what he needs to do. They said to him, we'll go with you. They went out, got into a boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, you'll find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple, whom Jesus loved, John, therefore said to Peter, it's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. And, continuing the narrative, when they got on the land, they saw a charcoal fire in place, with fish laid out on it, and bread. In other words, Jesus is serving breakfast to them. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you've just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Again, we see Peter mentioned in this context, in a leading position. And shortly after, we have the incident of, Jesus, of Peter making a confession of love toward the risen Jesus three times. And we might think of his denying Jesus three times. He now affirms his love for Jesus three times after he met uh, the Lord on the shores of Galilee. So reading from John 21, when they'd finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, notice how form, formal this is, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Does he mean more than the other apostles? Or does he mean more than the fish? After all, he started fishing. Let's go back to fishing. Do you love me and therefore the work I'm about to give you more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. And maybe that means younger people. Maybe it means new converts as they come in to the church. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep, tend them, care for them. He said to them the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Not only watch after them and protect them and tend them, but feed them, obviously in this case, with the gospel. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you're old, you'll stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. But Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who also had leaned back against him during the supper and had said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So the saying spread abroad among the brothers that this disciple was not yet to die. Yet Jesus 
not say to him that he was not to die, but if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? So evidently, as they, they left this scene with the, the breakfast, uh, Peter was walking with Christ and John was following behind uh, and no doubt listening, observing. And when Peter was aware that John was following, uh, he turned around and said, what's going to happen to him? Maybe that's undue curiosity. Maybe it's a bit of jealousy. It's another sign that Peter hasn't reached the point of his being sanctified, but he's still making mistakes. But give him time and the guidance of the Spirit, and he will do well. So uh, the point is, you follow me. Don't worry about the others. And then the account that Paul gives to the Corinthians, as he's telling them about his own conversion, about the resurrection, uh, the passage we already read was the appearances. Um, if I can skip down to the point uh, at the end, after he says, he's appeared to me, uh, the least of the apostles, and worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. And you notice he says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. And though it was not I, but the grace of God that's with me, whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. And one thing needed to be done before the day of Pentecost came, and that is to bring the number of the apostles back up to 12 after Judas had betrayed Christ and gone out and committed suicide. But Peter steps forth now to be the leader, very appropriately. He is now going to be the leader among the apostles, at least up until the day, the time of the conversion of Paul. So uh, we, we handled this very well. In Acts chapter one, in those days, Peter stood up among the brothers, the company of persons, it was all in all about 120. He said, brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in his ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his bowels gushed, gushed out, and it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called in their own language, a Akeldama, that is, field of blood. For it's written in the book of Psalms, may his camp become desolate, and let there be no one to dwell in it, and let another take his office. So with that, we will come to Pentecost, the first Pentecost, after the resurrection of Christ, 50 days afterwards, after his death, burial, and resurrection, that's the transition of Peter and the others, the other 11, from being disciples to being apostles, from being learners or students to those who are sent forth, sent out to preach the gospel. And now with the physical absence of Jesus, Peter will step into the position of leadership. And you begin to see that happening. He will step into that position of leadership with the establishment of the church and filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Peter will give a message, a brilliant message to the people gathered in Jerusalem on that first occasion of thus of the proclamation, the complete proclamation of the gospel. Now it can be completely preached because Jesus has indeed died, paid the price for our sins and been raised from the dead to confirm the fact that God has accepted his sacrifice. Now this event Pentecost, and the others following it will be covered in more detail in the next study. And at that point, we are going to switch entirely to Luke's account of the early church as is reflected in the book of Acts. So that's our next study, the ministry of Peter, focusing still on Peter, described by Luke in Acts, specifically the first 12 chapters of that book.